All right, so we have started and we are recording and just gonna wait a few minutes for people to pop in. Okay. And then we can get rolling. Yeah, this is gonna be fun. Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm, we're also about to go on break. So I'm like, I got that spring break energy, that, oh, that, that SBE going, I love it. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's good energy, although, in the last couple of days, it's been like um, literally freezing at night. I don't know how cold it is by you, but it was like 32 degrees last night. It's just. Yeah, it doesn't feel very spring. Yeah, it's not, it's not giving spring, as they say. I never, like, I see these people taking these really elaborate spring break trips. And I was like, who are these people? I never got like a fancy spring break trip. Mm. I had to work. <laughs> nope, I never, never went to anywhere warm like yeah anywhere it, south of the new york city area i, went in spring I was break. in missouri and they took spring break even like last week or the week before and it was really cold I was just yeah like, I don't know. it's not springy it's not nice springy now. enough all righty so i'm gonna do the intro and we'll we can get started and uh i'm sure more people will pop in as they usually do okay. uh so uh <laughs> excuse our talking everybody thank you and welcome to the final uh, talk in the spring 2023 Sarah Little Turnbull Visiting Designer Lecture Series. We've, uh, this semester, we've been talking to various luminaries in the world of design, activism, the sciences, and today we're gonna be talking to someone in the fine arts, uh, an artist and gallery uh, owner um, and, and curator. This semester, uh, you've been following along, you know, we've been focusing on design uh, art and design specifically through a queer lens. Uh, so queer representation in the design industry, how the products of that industry include queer and non-binary users and audiences, and also uh, how queer stories and queer narratives are um, handled in the arts. Um, this series is running concurrently with the Lehman College Art Gallery's current exhibition called Queer Love, Affection and Romance in Contemporary Art which presents paintings and photographs that illuminate both individual and universal stories of vulnerability, tenderness, and desire in the LGBTQIA plus community. It opened on uh, February 14th and it closes at the end of April, which is we're shortly coming upon. This lecture series is also a direct component of an interdisciplinary LGBTQIA plus design course. Some of them the students are here today. Uh, and it focuses on issue these same issues in the design realm. Uh, some of them are are here today, and, and hopefully, be they'll be interacting with us through the Q and A. Uh, and as uh, as as well, this is open to the public, so anyone who's here, please ask a question. There's a little Q and A uh, button at the bottom of your screen. If you have any, even if you have like a random thought, drop it in there, and we can respond to it. Uh, and now, finally, our guest today. C. Finley, founder and curator of, of the Every Woman Biennial and director of the La Mama Galleria is known for her elaborate paintings and intense use of color, monumental murals, multidisciplinary collaborations and her activism through urban art interventions, including her acclaimed wallpaper dumpsters. Uh, as the creator of the 2014 to 2021 Every Woman Biennial, she exhibited 1,200 female and non-binary artists in New York, Los Angeles, and London. Finley is shown internationally with exhibitions at Gallery Ernst Hilger, Vienna, uh, Super Chief Gallery in Los Angeles, the Toth Gallery in New York, Context Art Miami, uh, Scope Miami in New York, FDA Projects in Rome, High Energy Constructs in Salon Oblique, Los Angeles, and the Dumba Collective, in New York. Uh, Finley received her BFA from Pratt and her MFA from California State University in Long Beach. And her work has been featured in the New York Times, uh, La Republica, Dazed, Dazed, Fast Company, Women's Wear Daily, Lala, and more. Thank you so much for being here today. We're really jazzed to have you. Um, and uh, welcome. Thank you. I am really honored to be here and I'm so happy to share my work with everyone. Great. So let's get into it then. I see you have um, one of these massive murals are, you know, right in front of us. Tell us about what you've been working on. Yeah, so I started with this. I, I always imagined this piece as my calling card. I feel mm. like 
you very rarely see this much of a divine feminine mural at the scale. It's about seven stories high. It's in Los Angeles, California. This was my first large scale in the, in the biz, they call it a monster wall. Right. Um, and I think this was a big part of helping me realize, you know, next steps in my own career and uh, just kind of put me on the map as far as street art, mural, public art was concerned. It was a, yeah. a larger commission than I'd ever had before. And I, I'll walk everybody through that because I, I feel like part of the reason why I'm here is to show how I did what I did from yeah. a person who came from pretty modest means from the middle of nowhere in Missouri to come to New York, luckily got into Pratt Institute by the skin of my teeth, and then what? <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I think a lot of students are always like, okay, so, but how did you actually do it? How do you talk to these? How do you, how do you communicate with people? How do you, how do you get in the mix? Yeah. So um, if it's all right with you, let's get started. Yeah, go for it. Take cool. it away. So I'm just like a brief intro. Um, you introduced me and like read this bio that I have here, but I just wanted yeah. to say also, um, I really work at the intersection of color, creativity, women, and the environment. So those things are kind of a triangle of what I'm interested in as a human. Mm -hmm. I really genuinely believe that color is so important. It can change the world. It you know, the vibrancy of it, it's the way we see. Mm -hmm. um, and as you'll see in my paintings, I use color, I try to push color as far as I can possibly go and get as many colors into the picture plane as humanly possible, which I, I feel like is a very queer thing to do. <laughs> like, um, and so I, I have different practices to my studio and I started out uh, really wanting to be a studio painter. I imagined my life to be, you know, working in the studio, taking these things to a gallery, having a gallery help me sell them and having like this fabulous career. You know, when I, when I was 23 years old, that's what I, you know, I thought by the time I was yeah. 25, it'd be all done and dusted. Right. And so I'm going to just walk you through some of the paintings that I've been creating in my career. As you can see, this is actually a first painting that I made during COVID um, and it's called introspection, but you can see like, you know, there's a dynamism, dynamism in the color. There's an energy. <laughs> Um, and I, I'm always trying to push opposite. So like you're introspective, but there's also this powerful radial color coming at you. Yeah. Um, this is an older painting called Moves Moves, which um, I'm also really interested in love, queer love, and just these moments of falling in love and what it means and passion and that electricity that happens between two people. So here we have color like a palette where I really limited my color to pink. Mm. Um, and I tried to push all the pinks that I had as far and as minimally as I could go just within that color zone, which as a colorist, you know, you're always trying to figure out what one color, how far one color can go. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes I think it's helpful to limit your palette and play around and see how far you can push it. This this piece almost kind of looks pastel-y. Am I imagining that yeah. or is that? It's that's, soft. You know, yeah, it's really soft and desaturated. It's interesting. Yeah, which is a little bit of a departure for me really. Like most yeah. of my work is very high vibrancy, but yeah. I also wanted to show that I have range. And this is an older painting. So it's like, this is me learning how to play. Right. with these colors you know there's probably 80 colors in here that I mixed by hand right. so now you're really like learning the material yeah I, and yeah. I, I work in acrylic mostly okay um and so I had an opportunity I had a residency in Rome that turned into about 12 years of living in Italy and I just wanted to throw this up because all of these are Italian icons you know the mm -hmm. giant foot uh, the Santa Lucia, the eyes on the little sprig of a sapling tree, and obviously Michelangelo's Pietà. Right. And I think, oh, well, I'm incredibly inspired by Italy and Michelangelo in particular. Um, but I think that I tried to make it my own, and I'm using this kaleidoscopic prismic color to um, reimagine a marble sculpture. Also, when I made the Pietà painting, I went to the Vatican to see 
Michelangelo's Pieta, and I was very excited because yeah. you know, I was like from Central Missouri. Yeah, it's unbelievable <laughs> going there for the first yeah. time. But it's so because it's been attacked. It's so far away. It's behind yeah. glass, and you can't get close. So I think one of the reasons that I wanted to paint this was so I could go into all the spaces and places. And I, I often think that sometimes when you're a student or a younger, younger artist, it's okay to take a masterwork and reimagine it and play with it because you learn a lot. I learned a lot about the geometry of this beautiful triangle, the composition, the folds, the depth. The, you know, I, even though I work in a flat mm -hmm. way, it really did help me to understand a great masterwork to like yeah. remake it myself, which I think a lot of you, you assign that sometimes. I definitely had that assignment, but this is something that I did on my own at the beginning of my career. So flashing forward, this is probably the most recent painting that I created. It's pretty large scale, 66 by 66. And I wanna talk about scale a lot um, mm -hmm. in this lecture and we'll, we'll get there. But you know, now you're seeing me creating my own icon. This is a photograph that I took myself of a, a model yeah. Uh, I'm using a lot of mythology here. We have a sun goddess, we have the moon, we have the sun in like perfect harmony. We have balance. We're having like maybe even a Libra astrological moment, a celestial moment. Um, and I recently turned this into a mural that was very long and the, the blue sky became an incredible negative space. And then we had an event at La Mama Galleria where women were invited to tell their stories on these stars. And then we processed to the mural with these story stars and I wheat pasted all these story stars into the starry night sky of justice because I felt like a lot of people were seeking justice. So now you see that I'm using this painting as something that then goes forward into um, many different, like, you know, now it can also be a print, which I wanna mm -hmm. talk about as something where I can make money to generate income for myself. Yeah, um, it's a standalone painting, which will probably go in some sort of exhibition and it's a mural and um, a live event where people can gather, come together, create community and then be a part of something that's public, free and accessible. Which is which is different in some way. It's the opposite of what you were just saying about Vieta, for example, and, and other very famous works of art, like you can't really even get close to them. There's and a lack of access there, right? And it's funny because I never saw myself as someone who was contrarian, but I really do <laughs> have a bone to pick with the art world in a weird way about accessibility. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that's why people are really drawn to street art. I think yeah. that's why Banksy and people like that strike a chord with people. One, I think the work is a little easy to, it's easier to understand, yeah. but it's also free. Like you can just walk to work and stumble upon something and have your own beautiful moment. You don't have to pay $20 to walk in and, yeah. and you're, you know, you're dialoguing with everybody. Yeah. And I, I always feel sometimes like I really, really wanted the art world to love me, but the art world is really a one-to-one -one thing. You have a painting, a dealer sells that to a collector. It goes to their home. And that's kind of that arc of that journey. And it turns out I'm more public. I really want to talk to a wider audience. I want more people to see, experience, and love my work. I, I feel like I'm a million to one person. Like I would love to connect with that many people. But it yeah. took a long time for me to understand that, you know, a lot of disappointment and frustration with the art world. So now it's like I have a playfulness with it, which is part of the Every Woman Biennial and like some right. of these projects that I do, which we'll get to. I'm just okay. showing some paintings. Um, I, wa I want to yeah. establish myself to everybody here as a colorist and just a person yeah. who, you know, sits in my studio and works really hard and like does anything I can to create these type of things. And then we'll like see how those go out into the world. So I had a big show at La Mama Galleria, the, the gallery where I'm the director, a while back in 2016. Um, and I actually used the framework of the Zodiac. So the mm -hmm. centerpiece is the Leo. There's the Virgo, the girl at the top and then the Aries, which is the classical head at the bottom, which is actually the charioteer, a sculpture from, you know, Hellenistic right. sculpture. Gotcha. And yeah. um, so I'm always like kind of picking, you know, I love to time travel. I love like, you know, ancient worlds and I love everything contemporary. So I feel like the colors are very contemporary, but some of the subject matters could be older and, you know, it's just a crazy mixed up time travel world in which I live. Yeah. 
<laughs> but again, like, you know, the Leo, Leo is the sun, is the, is ruled by the sun. And so I really wanted the Leo to feel like warm. And so you feel that palette where everything, and there's some purples and some blues in there because I wanted to offset it, but I really like use the palette to be like the sun or something hot or warm. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanna show you that these are, you know, thumbnails basically in a pitch or in a deck that I'm showing you. But later I'm gonna yeah. show you the power of documentation on site, which is something that I wanna also speak to with the students because I know a lot of people are working digitally, but when you do have an exhibition, um, as a gallery director and as an artist, I'm seeing that people succeed who have fantastic documentation of their work in, Interesting. in a place. Yeah. So I have these good images of my paintings, but I haven't been the best human to document my goings on. Right. And I want to like really let everybody know that when you do a show or you do something physical, now if it's digital and you can have it for the rest of your life, that's a different thing. But yeah. anytime you're stepping into something that's a rarefied thing where it's just going to happen for that month or maybe even that day, you've got to take an hour before the show opens to document everything. I mean, everything, even if you don't even know or you think it's stupid, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You have to like befriend photographers. You have to become a photographer. Even if it's with your iPhone, get a tripod, get some gear, like light it and make it look so sexy because in the yep. future, that's what you're going to have in your decks to sell who you are and your abilities all come from that documentation. So I'm going to yep. show you these works later, you know, in their true scale in a space. And you're going to be like, wow, that's a very different story. Here, here we go. Yeah. So like you can see the difference. So here's just like the thumbnails. And now we're seeing that in the physical reality where you see the scale, you're experiencing them, you know, they're monumental paintings. They're like, you know, you can say that's 86 inches on the thumbnail, but you really don't get a sense of that until you're in the space. No. So I was lucky that I got good documentation. I worked with a photographer friend. She did it for me for free. I bought her a beautiful dinner <laughs> and she's a dear friend of mine still to this day. And now I pay her because I can afford it. But you know, when, I, when we were young and we were coming up, she was doing this for me and I was doing stuff for her and that's just how it went. We all, um, we all have friends like those. Yeah, exactly. Uh, here's just some that. more paintings, like just to show you the Phoenix is a new painting. Um, and again, like, I'm just literally trying to smash as much color as humanly possible into the picture plane. I'm also really interested in joy, positivity, and, and color as an expression of that. Like, how do we feel that exuberance of life, that hit of life? And e even that queering of life is, you know, through a joyful, positive color palette for me. Yeah. And you know, no, it's not everyone's cup of tea, and I, I totally acknowledge that. Um, I also wanted to say that one of the things that I did as a as an artist is I'm always looking for a ma different material. So this is a quilt that I um, made in collaboration with my friend Aaron wow. Chandra, who's a friend I went to school with. Yeah. And um, then there's a a project called Furnish where I would upcycle donated furniture objects with my material. Like basically I would decoupage it with my patterns and paintings. Yeah. And then we would make a performance on the street and give away everything free of charge to the public as a kind of conversation about value and how our art, art world gets so crazy with their prices. And then yeah. I made a series of balloons that I gave away at the Venice Biennale in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> because also you're you're it's like this high low yeah constant like play playfulness with the art world like you know yes this is like a five million dollar painting and here's a free art balloon <laughs> yeah right. and people were just like dumbfounded that we would be giving them away for free which is funny yeah to me. and so now we're moving on uh, to like I just wanted to show you how something small and kind of intimate like a studio painting which is about 22 inches you know so very modest painting, then becomes a commission for a lobby, which is now eight feet by 12 feet. And now that same 
concept becomes a monumental mural that I worked with the Houston Ballet. And so those are actual Houston Ballet dancers. Right. And there was a flood in Houston at this mm -hmm. time and the ballet was wrecked. And so we were yep. working with the Downtown Association, working with the Houston Ballet to bring awareness that they were still performing in alternative venues and that they needed help to raise money to fix the theater so that the dancers could continue dancing. Yeah. And so I love this idea where you're 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 creating a large scale mural, but you're doing it in in collaboration with the community. You're doing it in collaboration with um, so like some someone in need or or a philanthropy or you know another art world or like other artists like dancers who um, you know often need help and I love working with dancers because it just it I feel like dancers are the <laughs> like Olympic athletes of the art world and um, I've been working with dancers since 2010. So now we'll just go into a little pop of public art where you know I'm addressing like what is free and accessible art for all and what that might mean. And for me, I've been doing that through murals and the wallpaper dumpster projects. So this is the the part of the mural that I said where everyone put their own story into the stars. Um, and this was a big event. So it was a live event. We had music, we had kids, we had performances, we had all people coming together to participate in this community-based mural. So I wanna go like to the way back of my mural world because a lot of times younger people who haven't done anything, you know, publicly and public art in general, you gotta kind of get a few things under your belt before someone will take you seriously. Like you have to show a little proof of work. And I don't know how other people did it, but this is how I did it. You know, my friend owned this uh, charm company called Brooklyn Charm. She was not rich, but she was making a good living. And she had this wall. And I said to her, like, can I do a mural there? Like, and would you be willing to pay for the materials? And so she bought the paint and she bought me dinner. And I made this mural on Brooklyn Charm, which is right across the street. Also, always thinking about location from the Cobra mural of Andy Warhol and Jean-Michel Basquiat, right in the heart of Williamsburg. You know, I knew a lot of people would see it. And I got a lot of work from this. You know, I signed it. I sent people right to my Instagram. And a lot of people took pictures of it, reposted it, and I got some work and some other mural jobs from this. So this is like the humble beginning. This is the second humble beginning. You know, now I'm getting a little bit better. And again, this is quality mending company. I had a friend of a friend who knew the guy who had like a wall that he always used for murals. He gave me some money for materials and he had a nice soiree at, uh, at his shop there. And again, this is Soho, like I'm getting a lot of eyeballs. From this mural, I started getting some commercial gigs, which is really how I support my art practice today. Um, and this stayed up for about a year in Soho, and I got a lot of a lot of like hits from that. You know, the public art does really help your career a lot. This was another friend and family. Not a great wall. There's a lot of bumps and lumps on that wall. But again, she paid for materials. So now I have three medium-sized, you know, small to medium-sized murals under my belt. And now I'm going. I'm using that in a pitch deck, and I'm, you know, starting to work. And here, like, I'm getting a little bit better and a little bit bigger. And I went to my my friend, you know, went to go work in his local community in Hazard, Kentucky, <laughs> and invited me, you know, got me a little grant. I think, you know, I think this mural was about $12,000, which is not a lot when you think of materials and the rental equipment. No. So I'm not making huge amounts of money, but I'm really doing something that makes my heart sing. And the community went crazy for this. Like this is a small town in a, you know, a little smoky mountain town. And yeah. we're just like loving it, driving by, honking. We were, we had a really good time making this real. And I worked with high school students and, you know, just helping these children like figure out what they wanted to do with their lives, which was super fun. Again, like color, 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 color. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, here's another view of the um, Divine Feminine mural in Los Angeles. Like that's kind of the arc of the journey where I went from the super small and like trying, 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 and then finally got myself a monster wall. 
it's so funny because like there is a long history of street art in the Bronx, right? That goes, right. It goes back like well before the, the advent of hip hop, but then is certainly intertwined with hip hop, um, the, the, the birth of hip hop in the late seventies. And I feel like walking around, we're in the Bronx, Lehman, right? And I feel like walking around now, we're, we're sort of like, there are, isn't enough of this. Right. There I is, agree. Is, I mean, I want street art everywhere, personally. Yeah, I just think everywhere. That, and it's funny because they show, you know, even small towns like my hometown, I'm trying to get them, convince them to do like a big mural and maybe even like a mural festival. And, yep. you know, because it, there, there's proof that just shows that if you put on a mural festival, even in like a small town or anywhere, I mean, people come. Yeah. People love to see communities transformed through art. Yeah. I mean, it's a... It's a huge part of what I do. I love to surprise and delight people. I love to give it away for free. Yeah. I love for people to have access and I and comment wildly. You know, some people don't like it. Some people like it. Start a dialogue like, well, what would you do then? You know, if, if yeah. you had that. And so, you know, here I am now, I'm 47. It's taken me a long time, but I'm at a point where Colossal Media is calling me and paying me mm -hmm. for my designs and then painting them for me because this is a yep. huge amount of work like just yeah. labor like my shoulder has been through through it um, yeah yeah but now I you know I, this doesn't happen every day but it was awfully nice to be able to go to the job site and talk to everybody and like not have to be doing the labor of it but having my art scaled up in this way yeah and this was a, another part of that um, same mural project, just a different part of the building. Just this, wow. uh, and like whimsy, color, joyfulness, fish out of water. Like I always feel like fish out of water is a little bit of like a queering of the, of the space. And like yeah, just yeah. like playing around with stuff. Is this J Street? Where is that where this that is? This is um, Columbia Heights. Columbia, okay. It's, it's Dumbo, but yeah. it's, 50 Columbia Heights. It's really close to the bridge. It's a gotcha. beautiful view from there. Okay. Um, and then I, so like in my career, I'm getting going and now people are calling like businesses and companies are calling. So Pandora, the jewelry company that does the charm mm -hmm. bracelets mm -hmm. called me to do, um, to curate eight female artists in the street of loves. It was like a big extravaganza party that they were throwing. I put this mural up. I worked with a bunch of people from all over the country to come and paint in LA. Uh, so now I'm like curating other artists and putting things together in a larger way, which, you know, that's another way to like make a little bit of money from the thing, not only be the artist, but also be the organizer. Mm -hmm. So now we're like going into a project that I started in 2006. And th this is also where I like to play around with materiality and surprise. So you know, again, if a dumpster can be a work of art, anything is possible. This is my, you know, consciousness shifting um, project. And I've been, I've done it all over the world. And it's just a fun project because people really lose it when they see a dumpster that, you know, looks like this. So in Rome, they really like rallied around me. And now I'm like working with kids and I have the, it's called AMA. It's the trash company of Rome. They literally will give me a dumpster anytime I want. <laughs> like they love so like I did it guerrilla style the other thing is I wanted to talk about street art is like permission Question yeah what right. do you do when you're young and I have to say I have done these in a guerrilla style yeah two good results and I have also done them with permission so I prefer permission but sometimes you just have to do it yeah um there's something there's something seductive about the intervention Right. And yeah. like the invasion of, of public space yeah. and then with with really beautiful, non-destructive results, it kind of elevates it in a way that's different than. Yeah, it's I mean, this is using creativity to draw attention to yeah. uh, what we're doing about our waste. Yeah. You and know, something, something not to interrupt, but something else that occurs to me is that we tend to in America, at least we tend to look at jobs like like garbage collection as like this invisible it's like not even considered labor because it doesn't produce stuff, right? It's like care labor, care economy, yeah. like, like, you know, a childcare or being a nurse, but th these are, but most jobs are in this realm, right? And we overlook the labor. When they go on labor. strike, you know it. 
but you know yeah. it like look what's going on in paris i mean yeah that is they're the first line of defense like the whole mystique of paris is now in literally in flames because yeah, it's of a dumpster what, fire on the street it's a dumpster fire literally, on the street literally. yeah i love this i love this there it resonates the, and yeah. yeah this was like one of my earlier projects and i actually was taking a class called the interdisciplinary um artist and it was mm. about you know so i fancy myself a painter and i usually sure. paint or something in my in my world and so this class was you can't use paint if painting is your medium or if ceramics are your medium or if you use the computer like nope you can't use that you have to do something else and so i came up with the wallpapering of dumpsters because i was a, so to survive when i came out of school i worked in the film industry and i became a scenic painter mm. and when you're doing scenic you're also doing wallpapering you know anything on the surfaces of the walls behind what's happening in the film yeah. or even the editorial for magazines yeah and i had all these uh remnants of wallpaper but it was like two rolls which is not really enough to do even a big wall yeah. Um, or even a bathroom so I just and I had some really fancy wallpaper like this is Marilyn Monroe lips wallpaper um I've used Pharaoh and Ball like I've used William Morris like some of the fanciest hand silk yeah. paper because I just had it for free from doing these like fancy job shoots and um but I you know I I had it from different studios I was moving it and you know it was like taking up a chunk of my studio with like all these wallpaper remnants and when I took that class I was like and my friend worked in the port of Los Angeles and I could see those container ships and they were all solid colors and they're kind of mm. beautiful. Yeah. I was like, wow, I just want to put a pattern like right, like it's some kind of Baroque pattern, like right in the middle of that and just see what would happen. Yeah. And then it just kind of came to me like, this is like that container, like the yeah. big metal, like one color object. So I just, my friend had a dumpster in his studio um, near the near the port of LA. And so it was private, so I could do it without yeah. like, trouble. So yeah. I did that one. And then I did one on my college campus for Cal State Long Beach when I was getting my master's degree. And honestly, the reception was very lukewarm. Like nobody really reacted to it. But then I did it in Italy and people <laughs> really lost it. And I got, you know, I was in the New York Times at La Repubblica of Italy mm -hmm. and people were calling me and it became, it was like a viral thing. But in 2006, it was even like on Facebook, it was like before viral was even a thing. Yeah. And I realized like, oh, so other students didn't really know what they were talk talking about. Like you got to sometimes just take it to the people. Yeah. And yeah, see. This this upper the one on the upper right is William Morris right the, the flower yeah. the, and that the, one's the, in San Francisco and actually someone stole one of those like the next day <laughs> I'm sure yeah no that that's interesting I love just I just want to pause and just commend you for referencing the arts and crafts movement in your contemporary art I just think that is so awesome yeah. I mean this, this is a design lecture and all like we should be talking about well, the roots of design and you know I don't like see bit, such a big difference. I I mean, I think beauty is everywhere. Yeah, it can kind of be in anything. Clearly, yeah. I think there's like so many distinctions, and I think that's less and less as we like ramble around and like just be who we are. Yeah. Um, and like the, who cares like what snobs think is this or that? But yeah, like I love the yeah. high low. I love craft. I love you know that's why I made a quilt. Yeah. I love um, it. I, yeah, no, that's great. And I also like it's it goes back to like Rauschenberg and and Warhol in a way like it's sort of continuing a thread that exactly. was laid in the, the pop art movement. And it's just, you know, it's expanding that pattern. And I love that. That's so incredible. Thank you for noticing all of that. Goody, those goodies. Oh, yeah. They're no, all in it. there. You know, I'm always They're thinking all in there. stuff. Yeah, I love okay, it. Okay, so this is uh, one of the paintings that's in the Queer Love Show. Mm -hmm. um, it's my friend Florencia and Krista. They were like in total love when I had this photo shoot with them, which was really fun. And then I put traditional American patchwork quilt units um, and then I cut them up into a psychedelia and paint them intuitively is the process of that style. And it came to me later that I was really trying to take hard edge geometric abstraction and make it soft and something recognizable. And I think when you look at that geometry, yeah, it's geometry, but there is something that you recognize about it because it is a quilting pattern. It's just yeah. not, it's, you know, cut up. So it's not like exactly what you recognize, but there is something that I'm trying to like soft or soften in those, well, in the colors. Well, I mean, would you say then that you're queering it? Is that an accurate use I of mean, the term? I mean, that's definitely part of it. And I think 
you know, it's like trying to take those things that might be opposite or have differences and put them together and harmonize okay. it. Yeah. So that's um, just that's just the dialectic, right? That's like taking the the, the thesis, the antithesis, and creating yeah. the synthesis, and it neuters the, the the dynamics between them and creates something new. I mean, that's the way. It's that's like a, a, it's a trans. It's alchemy. Yeah. You know, this yeah. is where you get your precious gold. And right. so, yeah, you take something, you know, wallpaper is very precious. You yeah. don't get that on the ground. You don't touch, the dirt doesn't touch it. It's fragile, You yeah. put something that's so pristine and precious and, and feminine. Yeah. You know, think in boudoirs and, you know, like, yeah. you know, Victorian patterns and things. And you put that on maybe one of the, like, ugliest things, like, completely brutish. Yeah. Like, and so, something we, t we want to be invisible. In other oh words, yeah you know exactly. and you make it highly you make it not just visible but like and decorative they, they celebrate build over. pages around them to like yeah wall them off so you can not yeah. possibly look at the trash of yeah of I, you like <laughs> of your yeah life. of your own life yeah exactly so now i just wanted to get into some professional practices that might help sure. some folks that are here yeah um, and what i what i learned throughout my career is to start where you are with what you have because when I was at Cal State Long Beach, I always felt like a bit of an underdog. I felt like Cal Arts, UCLA, you know, even some, you know, other just cooler schools, you know, mm -hmm. Otis, there were all these cool art schools that I felt had better professors, better resources, better eyeballs on your work, studio yeah. visits, like better connections with the gallery world, all that stuff. And I was like, well, what do we have here? And at Cal State Long Beach, we had a really beautiful multi-million dollar gallery complex that honestly Cal Arts did not have. And I thought, okay, so a few students and I, we created a juried art exhibition of all the schools from Santa Barbara to Las Vegas to San Diego. We invited all the MFA students, which it was this really beautiful mix of people to apply for free to our juried art exhibition at Cal State Long Beach. And when we did that, we now had, you know, 75 artists, cool artists that I ended up meeting and creating personal relationships with coming to our school, put on a beautiful show. We had a great, um, we had a, a, you know, a great opening reception. And at the same time, Cal State uh, opened their studios. So now you have the whole art world coming to this show and then we're inviting them to also open our studios. This is now in its 15th year, mm. but I was just looking around saying, what is here? Like, I'm, I'm annoyed that we are not the hot stuff thing, but what, what can we do? Like, we may not be able to get the best gallery in the world to come do a studio visit here, but what can we do? And it turned out that a lot of opportunities started happening for people because we invited people to come where we were right. and we made it and we made an opportunity. So I ended up meeting like some of the coolest artists in the art world today, people who are in the Whitney Biennial, people who have major gallery deals. Uh, Amanda Ross Ho became a really good friend of mine because I curated her art. We had a great conversation. We just hit it off and we became friends. So it's like, I've also curated shows for myself, you know, where I put myself in three or four other artists that I admired. I put that all together. We'd have it at a coffee shop or we'd have it at even someone's home, if they had some, yeah. home, like if someone has a loft or something like that, just start where you are with, with what you've got. And then also with who you've got. So, you know, you're, you're mixing and matching with people. If you have a strong connection with someone that's, that's gold. Like yeah. those connections and friendships are everything. Cause if yeah. that person hits, they bring you up. If you hit, you bring them up. And that's how the whole art world really works is on relationships. Yeah. And so one of the things, you know, I was always like running around with 10 jobs. I was a bartender. I was, I was a gig economy worker. I worked in the film industry. I worked as an art shipper, as an art handler. I worked in art studios. I, I kind of did anything I could, but yeah. mostly bartending um, so that I could have time to work on my work. But I found that I started to do prints of my artwork. And I print them at Adorama, at Printique. They're $2 for archival quality prints. And I sell them for $150. Mm. So the, I, you know, 
every and I and I do that on an editorial calendar like I open my calendar if there is something that matches an Easter or resurrection theme or anything like that Christmas Hanukkah Kwanzaa like Valentine's Day you know summer solstice whatever right. you're into like find those dates and six weeks out get your production going print to order so you don't have to have any skin in the game get right. your shipping labels tight get a nice printer and you can make some decent money from a print run and get your work out there it's affordable and it's just something that helped me when i was young to like get some money like i needed yeah. five thousand dollars to do a project that i wanted to do well i put out three or four prints and i just kept hitting it hard and advertising and telling everybody and showing people and i i met my i met my goal through selling prints wow um and collaborating with friends i kind of hit that up on the beginning with start with um where you are with what you have and like you know your friends and your relationships are everything and so that kind of folds into show up like if your friend has a show or if there's a show that you admire the person you go there and you stay there the whole time you yeah. meet like-minded people who are doing things that you admire if someone's doing something better than you you go talk to them and figure out what's going on go work for them go volunteer yeah. go ask them for a coffee five minutes of their time anything just get yourself in there but you've got to show up and you've got to follow the threads like you just because larry gagosian was larry gagosian who cares if the work is not of your true heart's desire go to a smaller gallery like find yeah. what you like and show up consistently at those places and spaces and meet people then i would also say apply apply to everything i've got a stack of rejection letters like bigger than lehman college campus <laughs> like, <laughs> and you got to have thick skin and you just have to like tough it out and just keep applying because what happens with applying is that it's not necessarily if you get it it's that six people who are artwork professionals are looking at your work three times, yeah. five times, 10 times. And then they finally have the opportunity to put you in because it's yeah. a dance. And as a person who's on the other side, as a gallerist, the amount of proposals I get for shows and the actual shows that I give, mm -hmm. I mean, it is rough. It is rough. Yeah. It's a miracle. Everything is a miracle. <laughs> Everything's a miracle. I totally <laughs> and, agree. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, you know, you got to do a hundred no's to get that one. Yes. It's just, yep. it's almost like a numbers game. So apply for residencies, apply for grants, apply for any opportunity you can. It's all on NIFA. There's yep. lots of resources. Queer art mentorship is a great way. They have beautiful platform for like a lot of things that are queer. I'm a mentor yeah. on that. Yeah. Apply for that. Apply for queer art mentorship. Yeah. Um, and then I know a lot of people here are probably graphic designers or have some kind of design skill, which is awesome because one of the things that I never learned was a pitch deck. Yeah. You know, a lot of these murals yeah. begin with me taking a photo of the wall and mocking up some of my original artwork on top of that wall to make it look like it is a mural on the wall. It's, it's very dazzling to people. And it's a much better way than to say, hey, I'd like to do a mural on your wall. It'd be like, hey, I'd like to do a mural on your wall. And I mocked up these three options for you. And I'm happy to like continue sketching. Would you be interested in like a thousand or $1,200 budget for paint and materials? Yeah. You know, like, and, and pitch it to owners of buildings. It's actually something that I do with my students in my painting class. I make them create a pitch deck and an artwork to pitch to a local community member or business yeah that's and great see, Just... yeah and of i i think i had 18 students two of them actually connected with spaces and were able to produce the mural and we all yeah. helped them from the class so they had labor it's a no it's like you said it's a numbers game so you throw a bunch of things at the wall something's mm -hmm. got to stick like but in that i feel like also hearing no is critical Hearing, oh, yeah. you know, and will, learning, you know, learning to deal with it's critical. I'm it was devastating that. to me to realize that even my closest friends don't really love my work and, and vice versa. You know, like I have some dear friends who I could <laughs> not care anything about their artwork. I love having dinner with them. I love talking to them. I love who they are, but I do not like their work. I'm not putting it on my wall. I wouldn't, yeah. I'm not unkind and they're not unkind right. to me, but I know after decades of friendship that they're not going to put one of my paintings on their wall and yeah versa. Sam. and Sam. the world is like this you know four percent of the people actually collect art of all yeah. people 
it's like Love almost the 4%, nobody. You're going to get like a tenth of a percentage of people who actually yeah. like your work. So yeah. imagine those numbers. <laughs> it's not much. I mean, just, to, yeah, my, my wife, who is my best friend, doesn't really like when I first showed her some of my work my new work that I had done a couple years ago she's like Dave I don't know and that was the first yeah. thing out of her mouth. it's funny because and everyone's different like the other thing is like this and I just found this definition of beauty which I think is brilliant which is unity in variety mm -hmm. so we're all this individualization of whatever universal theme you think this is but we're all unique little flowers yeah and some people are going to be attracted to the novel you write or the flower that you are or the artwork and others are not. And that's just yeah. a bitter pill that you are going to have to learn how to swallow because it's just the way of the world. Not everybody's going to be in love. Yeah. And that whole, just to just stem off of that, the whole unity in variety is really one of the founding principles of design, right? I mean, that is like, basically, if you're designing something beautiful, you're going to have varied components, but they all have to unify. So it like really is a design discussion when you're yeah. talking about that. It's how and to it's design like that. Guiding, it's also a guiding principle of my my politics, my 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 life, which is yeah. I love the uniqueness in everyone, and I may not be a person that's going to buy it and put it on my wall, but I'm so here for everybody creating their own thing. Yeah. Like I'll do me, and you do you. Yeah. And let's just see what happens because everyone is so weird, so awesome, so unique. I think, you know, part of the queer agenda is like squashing this BS yeah. about, you know, you have to live just like me. And I just really dislike that. That's to me, that's beige. Yeah. Like you want everybody to be beige. That could not be more boring in my life. Like yeah. look at this painting on the screen. Yeah. I, it's a, come on. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think you're touching on pluriversal versus universal, right? Like that universal suggests that there is one reality and we're all sort of feeding off of it. And pluriversal suggests that we all have our own sort of reality, our own voices, and they're all valid. And we can find the unity within that. Like that's really, it's and like I you're getting. Yeah, I genuinely yeah. believe that, you know, and I've traveled a lot and I've met a lot of people very different than myself. I come from a place that's very different than who I am. Sure. And I genuinely believe in the goodness of people. I, yeah. I know for a fact that what's happening in media is not actually what's happening between folks on the ground in- Of course. You know, when I go to Italy and I travel there, people are so kind. When I go to the yeah. Midwest, even a hard edge Republican, I can find yeah. some common ground with that person. And I think it's important to have conversations with people who disagree with you and yeah. find some common ground because genuinely I believe people just want to eat. They want to express themselves. They want to have a nice place to hang their hat. You know, they want yeah. clean water and they want to like maybe have some nature and, you know, like, and to be able to paint or create or design and yeah. just to be, and to have yeah. like a pretty base, you know, like most people are not, you know, striving for like, you know the world at the end of the day of course you have all yeah. those desires in your heart but like really your needs are pretty simple and like most people are pretty like interested in the harmony of of life mm -hmm. in my opinion yeah. and there's plenty of places and spaces where we need to like poke and prod and change and move and and like i think art and creativity and humor is a much better way shower for yeah. reaching across the aisle and having better conversations, smarter yeah. conversations and conversations that can actually do something. I think that's right. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, and, and then this last piece here, documenting everything. The most important piece. I mean, yeah, I can tell you that as, a, as an artist, as mm -hmm. a gallery director, as a person in public art, as a person who throws large scale exhibitions and invites hundreds of people, the number one thing is proof of work. The number one thing is righteous documentation because it kind of doesn't exist after the fact if you yeah. don't really get it. And I've, I have, I'm upset. When I look at some of my most successful friends who are getting big commissions and getting the big money stuff like the like the big ones, you know, where you're getting yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars to create a work of art. 
Mm -hmm. uh, they have righteous documentation. Their websites are very focused on their exhibitions and their work in space. Yeah. It just, it sets a tone for, prof your, it's professional and it, it just, it makes the work look good. It yeah. makes you look good. No, that's a really good point. And it's also occurred to me as you were telling, talking about this earlier, that it's it's kind of like storytelling. I mean, it's storytelling who you are as an artist. I mean, if you look at like um, early art history, right? Bef you know, hundreds of years ago, like even pre-Renaissance art history, uh, the, there were no images, there were no pictures back then. So like in books, like the, it was very nascent technology. So like a typical art his, history um, about an artist, like a Greek, like an ancient Greek artist is really just stories about that person's life, just anecdotes, right? It's just stories about how they, you know, they were able, they were so talented that they could convince people that what they were painting was actually real or something like that. Like they're anecdotal, yeah. right? When art history today, not to knock art historians, they do great work, but it's not as anecdotal. It's more, you know, it's more nuanced than that. And it's more broad and, and as analysis, but the story of the artist is so powerful. Uh, and and like, I feel like- it's, it's also something that you work on a lot. You know, yeah. I started out in thinking one way and through decades of practice, I'm at a different place. You know, I thought I was gonna be a studio artist. I thought I was gonna yeah. sit in the studio and have two shows a year in major museums and sell work and call it a day. Yeah. Turns out I <laughs> have to include literally every human person in New York City for my project and yeah. you know touch people in places and spaces outside of that world because I'm actually more interested in what the every person has to say than I am about this rarefied elite world mm -hmm. like I just mm -hmm. don't care about that. It turns out it took a long time to find that. But you yeah. know, my, right now I'm rewriting my story again. I've actually hired a writer to come and help me like synthesize all of these projects and you know, yeah. this wheel of work that I've been working on with all these different spindles and all of these different mediums to help me synthesize yeah. you know, where I am today. And it's a it, it's a beautiful process, it's a hard process, and it's you know, it's, it's amazing. Cause it's like, I wonder in 20 more years, what will happen? Like what story yeah. I'll be telling then? It's kind of interesting. Cause it sounds, it almost sounds like what you're talking about. is like branding in a way. It's yeah. all about getting a brand identity. And it's interesting. We, in the last five lectures this semester, we've kind of touched on this idea of branding the queer movement, the queer and non-binary movement. Um, and, and it was suggested that that could possibly be uh, the way to strengthen and galvanize this movement. Um, I was speaking with Ellie Bibbo, who works for Planned Parenthood, uh, national, the national branch. She's a designer and artist, art director for them. And they of course have pretty strong branding, Planned Parenthood. And of course they're on the, they're like on the, the forefront of a couple different movements, certainly women's health and access to health. That's a clear thing that Planned Parenthood has always sort of been around for. But honestly, a lot of their work has to do with trans health because their tr the health needs of trans people are uniquely under attack and exactly. they're less they're less visible to the medical profession. They're, you know, uh, you, you know, the, the a litany of different issues. And so a lot of what Planned Parenthood had, has done in terms of design is to help brand the movement, right? And as someone who deals with a lot of color in their work, I was wondering if you could maybe comment on this because one of the things we talked about was how do we brand the LGBTQIA plus movement? It already has so many letters in it. The brand is kind of getting sort of big and splintered. And uh, there, there are certainly, there's the pride flag and then there's a whole sort of sub, um, sub community of smaller flags for the different communities. And they all involve color, right? As flags often do. Uh, is that really the best way to brand what we're talking about here? And and if not, like, do you have any thoughts on this as an artist who uses a lot of color and is kind of undergoing a brand discussion yourself? Well, I do think that, you know, it's so plural. There's so many things all yeah. at once. It's everything everywhere all at once, you know? And that movie yeah. is something yeah. that is so fantastic, but it's also something that I don't really want to watch again and again. 
Yeah, true. Um, and so I think for me, it's human rights. And yeah. the more that we band together with marginalized communities as one, the stronger I think our voice will be. So for me, the, it, I, when I see the brand, I see it as free choice. Mm -hmm. Like I'm free to be me and you're free to be you. And I'm not mm. going to tell you what to do. And you're not going to tell me what to do. And mm. it's almost, if we could brand it like that, where it, yeah. it's like free choice, period. Yeah. For all. That's something, I think that's something that would actually resonate across many different interests in many different bisections of the American public. Exactly. You know? And I kind of feel like sometimes, well, I think, I think that queer people have an agenda and they need to fight for their rights, period. Like, yep. you know, but yep. if we're talking about branding and we're talking about how that's getting diluted because it's going further and further into this individual little or small, yeah. well, the thing is, is like those things don't have as much power because you need people. You need yeah. millions, not hundreds or thousands. Yeah. You know, you need every single member of marginalized community all over the world to understand and push yeah. for their freedom of choice. We and need solidarity. Exactly. Yeah. And I don't yeah. exactly know how to do that, but that would be my strategy, which is to gotcha. somehow synthesize one simpler a rally cry for all. Yeah. And see if you could even like get that across the island to some people who like would be like, well, I like that too. Yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> I think it's there. If you're talking about freedom and freedom of expression, that's in our DNA as a country, as a yeah. nation. There's a question here from Melanie. She's asking in a world where group, and it's related to what we're talking about, in a world where groups of people have to fight to exist in public spaces, why is it so important to have queer artwork placed in casual spaces like, like street art is? Well, I just think that the more exposure and the more people can see the beauty yeah. in the difference and variety of life, the more they can come to it on their own terms. I think, you know, it, in my opinion, I don't like people telling me how to feel, act, or be. Mm. Yep. So I don't like people being didactic to me about their, how they feel I should feel. I don't want someone yeah. telling me how to feel. But right. if I come to it of my own volition and free will and think, wow, that's beautiful. Oh, that yeah. artist is queer. Oh, yeah. I can see that now. Oh, I see there's two women there. Yeah. Like, I've now got you because it's beautiful and it's creative and it's like giving you desire or fun or yeah. surprise and you find out, oh, 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 okay, I see that, I see that. Now we're having a different conversation and it's, it's the person's free choice yeah. to change their mind, their heart, their, you know, through creativity, through color, through passion, through desire. And I also see like, in a, like we could reframe Melanie's question in, in, in another way or, or ask the other, the opposite question is why is it so accepted for cisgender messaging to just be in public space walking down the street? Like what, you know, we, we, we don't think anything of seeing an ad on a billboard with a man and a woman kissing or, you know, it's like totally fine to see, you know, we don't it question it. You know, and it's like, it's, it built, that is what has built over decades of messaging. That's what built, that's what's built a consensus narrative. And I feel like to answer Melanie's question, that's another reason it's important because that, yeah, the representation and that narrative is shifting and the locus of that, of consensus is shifting and we have to account for that. Yeah. And, and like, you know, as someone who grew up in, you know, I graduated high school in 1993, the literal only queer person I knew was Katie Lang. I mm. mean, that's how bad it was. There was no Will and Grace even, like nothing. No, that's, that's very true. Yeah. And I mean, there was, I didn't even too. know you could be like, yeah. I didn't, you know, I just didn't know. Yeah. And so, um, Interesting. And you know, I, what I, it, just, I think, just aside, not to interrupt, I just found out from watching the Whitney Houston biopic that she was was oh, yeah. um she's totally bi never knew that and I have to tell you I was watching this movie and I was absolutely upset like I was shook from learning this and I was upset at myself for not knowing that like how dumb could I have been 
Well, it was a, it was definitely hidden for a long time. I mean, I, yeah. I knew about it, but I was like a really deep Whitney Houston fan. And yeah, so like, was I. Like, but um, yeah, I mean, and, <laughs> and she was not allowed to be bisexual because right. she had a big career on the line. And again, that's, that's 1993. Right. Like that's when it's happening. Yeah. And we have a very different world now. There's still a lot of stickiness, a lot of problems is in yeah. America, but beyond. I mean, America is like practically free to compare to some of these other places and there's plenty yes. of work to be done. And yeah. so I I am personally not a mallet over the head person. I'm uh, sure. I'm gonna live, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be kind and, and cool. And I'm going to put this painting in an art exhibition in the Bronx. <laughs> yeah. And I'm gonna like live my life. And Great. I I'll take those consequences as they come, but like I yeah. I just think that creativity, humor, joy, positivity are a better mallet for the message yeah. for me. And I, I know yeah. that everyone has their way. And I support my brothers and sisters on the front line and others, like not my non-binary folks. I'm, I mean, yeah. I am basically non-binary, you know, like yeah. people are always asking me what my pronouns are. And I'm, you know, I ride an androgynous line, you know, that's just how I, how I was wired, how I was born, who I am. Yeah. And so just me existing in my like very masculine presenting self is something that you know, and I've taken some heat for it. I was thrown into lockers and called a dyke when I was a kid and whatever, like all that stuff. It's just ugly behavior. And personally, I just won't tolerate it anymore. I'm taking a page yeah. out of the Maya Angelou book. And if I hear off color things like that, and if yeah. I hear people being like that, I say something and I eject them from my space or I either remove them from my space or they, I remove myself Yeah. because I'm not standing for it. I'm not standing for the bullying. I'm not standing for people who can't get along in a civil way it's ugly behavior and yeah. you know i i'm as i as i get older i'm stronger and i'm more powerful yeah and i have more and i i'm also graceful i do this yeah. with a huge amount of politeness i'm not an, i'm not an angry person i'm i am a free individual but i choose to be yeah. And I use that as I navigate the world. And I don't, I do, I do not want to hurt anyone. I'm filled with a nonviolent feeling. Yeah. Like I want harmony and love. I'm, I'm a Libra. I am gentle. <laughs> I am light. I am soft. And uh, it's just who I am. I mean, look at these paintings. Like, you know, yeah. look at that tender moment between two women that you can't, yeah. like, it's gentle. I'm in, I'm in Aries, so uh, Aries, yeah. like, I'm on the attack for everything. So that's, you know, I have to I have to be a little bit more Pisces. I'm, like, right on the cusp there. Um, Finley, thank you so much. This has been incredible. Um, it's This went places. I have like, so many other questions or things we could talk about, but that we'll do that at some other point, hopefully. Uh, thank you again for meeting with us. I just want to also quickly thank um, the Turnbull Foundation and uh, Dorothy Dunn, who has made all of this possible. Thank you. Yes, thank you, um, Dorothy. Yeah, just amazing. Um, I want to thank uh, Bart in, in the gallery, in the Lehman College Art Gallery for helping with I this. I love Bart. I love you, yeah, Bart. <laughs> yeah, Bart, we love you. You're amazing, um, I, if you're listening. Uh, he'll see it uh, offline. And uh, I want to thank all the guests that we've had this semester. You guys have been amazing. And also thanks for everybody who's been showing up and asking really great questions and just being part of this. So thank you everybody. Thank you, Finley. Have a good summer and uh, I'll hope to see everybody next happy semester. Happy spring break. Yes, happy spring break to everybody. Thank you so Bye much. Thank Bye -bye. you so much. Bye-bye. Yes.